So each of the faculty members mentioned briefly some of the tools that they've used, but what other blended methods did each of you use in your projects that encouraged student engagement specifically and their learning? Start again with Sabrina. Um, so I showed you the, the Google tools tools that I used. Um, another uh, kind of blended method or flipped classroom method that I used was uh, student reading outside of the classroom and then um, journal reflections and responses um, that I would read uh, before class started on you know on Monday or something like that. Um, the interesting thing was that right they did it. They did the readings and the responses, and they hated it. Okay. Um, so, you know, the course evaluation was um, get rid of that book. Uh, don't make us write journal entries. Don't. But, you know, I will continue to use the book and make them write the entries or, or maybe change it in a little way, which, which I can talk about um, when we move down the questions. Um, but they were engaged. Um, and so even that negative response on their part to being asked to do this and think about it and respond, it made the classroom session um, much, it, it elevated mm -hmm. right, the, the classroom discussion uh, because they really did do the work and they were prepared for the class session. Um, so that was once once a week, not before every class session, um, but before the Monday class sessions. Um, the community-based learning and research um, activity uh, was another kind of flipped classroom engagement, blended, whatever word we want to use to describe it. They loved it. They loved having an outside audience that wasn't me. Okay. Um, and at the end of the semester, they presented. They presented to Chris, they presented to Sarah, they presented to other members of our community um, in academia and outside of academia. And that, again, really elevated their work. Um, and, and you could see the pressure laid on their face. Wait, who's coming to the presentation? But, you know, their outfits changed, they showed up early. Um, it, was, it was good for, for engagement. And then, of course, the, the screen testing project, which I didn't show a specific tool because um, I allowed the students to choose the tool uh, that they wanted to use. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without <coughs> her support. Um, she provided some in class um, one, two in class lessons, and then was there during some in class workshopping time that, that we had with the students. Um, I'll just start where Spring left off and then kind of circle back. The uh, community based learning and research, you know, the fact that there's a client that's outside the classroom. Uh, when I first started doing this, you know, I was worried that the students wouldn't be happy that they weren't doing something they chose, but instead they actually care that somebody else cares, right? They, they, they like that a lot. Um, I've talked a little bit uh, already about uh, the, the blended learning methods. I'll say a little bit more um, about Google Docs slash a wiki. Um, I'm not sure if, if in the wiki uh, format that I've used before, I really leveraged or was able to leverage the, the, the wiki abilities. And the fact is that I can look at tracking changes on a Google Doc as well. So number one, the first aspect is that the students are collaborating on something and I can describe in relatively open-ended ways you know, how much work they need to do on it and it's up to them to, to do something, but they know that I'm kind of grading them based on, on uh, participation. Um, so they are collaborating with each other. Uh, it's important for me to kind of set things up ahead of time because yes, I want them to think about it and this kind of goes to some thoughts that I had with our, our speaker uh, uh, earlier uh, this morning. Um, you know, sure, we want to give students agency, yes. But on the other hand, you know, part of the reason we're there is because we've got some ideas and some experience that we can help them with. So there's an aspect of setting things up ahead of time and again, working with a community member, it's important that uh, they and I kind of agree to some extent on where we think things are headed. Let the students think they're going to come up with all kinds of ideas. Part of it is that they don't really know what marketing research is, let's say. Name any course that, that we all teach, and they don't understand what it is, because that's why we're teaching it to them. Um, uh, they've got this picture of what it means to do something ahead of time. We're going to do marketing. Well, no, we're doing marketing research, and there's, you know, marketing is a big umbrella. We're not going to be designing posters. Yet they'll come up with ideas for that, and often those ideas that they come up with at that document are still useful to the community partner. It's just that that's not what they're going to be doing this semester. <coughs> so I think, for me, I guess what I'm choosing to, to answer this question with is 
how do I frame that Google Doc or Wiki ahead of time, and then how do I recover from uh, the various directions that it's gone at the end, and, and organize then these eight groups that, that, that we need? John? Um, I, will, I will piggyback on some of that and just talk a little bit about what we tried to do and what we ended up doing, because the two are not the same. Uh, what we tried to do was we identified tools. We did this in a very hierarchical way, which looking back on it was probably not the best way to go. But we looked at the series of tools that were available out there for allowing our students to collaborate with one another in a virtual space and selected the tool that had the most functionality that we thought would be the best position to allow students to easily take materials, compile them, and then work with other group members on a final project. This was during the fall semester in the Media Literacy course. So the tool that we thought worked best for that is actually a Microsoft product, which shocked me, called mm -hmm. OneNote, which is a very powerful product that allows students to share a notebook and collaborate on that notebook. Farah did some wonderful uh, tutorial videos for our students. We had them look through those tutorials. We sh I showed them in our class. We got them up uh, going on OneNote, and they shared their uh, materials with me. So I, I was also, uh, we, we're each of the professors were also uh, collaborators on each of the student projects there in the OneNote environment. And then halfway through the semester, we kind of checked back in on their OneNote folders and found them just basically empty. <laughs> and so we panicked, and we thought students were not doing any work on their projects. And so we went to our students and said, what's going on? You, you guys have a project, that due date, that's coming up at the end of the semester, and you've done literally nothing. Well, the answer was, they've actually done quite a bit, but they were not at all interested in using one. <laughs> they, it was a new tool that was, had a learning curve for them. They didn't use it uh, that often. And what they'd gone and done is simply create a Google Doc and shared it with the members of their group, and they were collaborating in that space. So that was a tremendous learning moment for us and for me, because that was a tool that students wanted to use and they liked to use. And even though the tool itself, compared with OneNote, has maybe a half or less of the kind of functionality of OneNote, uh, it was the tool that our students wanted to use and that they were leveraging that tool in interesting ways. So what, so do our students never come to technology and technology tools as a kind of tabula rasa. There is a kind of path dependence built into our uses of technology, not just in what tools we use, but how we use those tools. So now that Muhlenberg is actually moving to be a Google Apps for Education campus, I can imagine that Google Docs will feature much more prominently in the future in the way in which I have students uh, collaborate in on all kinds of projects, including online projects. So I guess my answer to that is kind of just this story about a learning moment for, for us about how technology gets used. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm actually gonna jump to question three because question two you all sort of answered with your goals and objectives and how your technology and your methods have aligned. So what didn't work so well? Uh, what didn't work the way that you had anticipated and how might you rethink these things for the future? Um, so I'll give uh, uh, two responses to that. And the first was the, the journal uh, that I mentioned. I didn't expect the students to be so upset about having to read <laughs> and write about what they read. Um, beca especially because there was another book that they read for class to which they posted and, and talked in the Google community. And they loved that book. It was the best book ever. And they just... They were like, this is great, keep doing this, I love that. So I had these, this test case within the classroom of one that was more um, textbook-like book and the other one which was more novel-like, but they were both nonfiction. Um, they really liked the novel style better and they liked discussing it in groups better. So uh, if I do, when I teach this class again, I may give them uh, the option or the opportunity to post their responses to the textbook type book in this community format. Um, I, I don't know if it's the material itself or if it's that discussion with their peers as opposed to me just being the only person who reads their responses um, that elicited that, that negative feedback on their behalf, but that's something that I'm, that I'm going to change. 
Um, and then the other was, I did not anticipate, despite Farrah telling me that it was going to be okay, <laughs> I did not anticipate the success of the screencast and the lack of um, stress that the students felt about this project. I was stressed out about this project for the whole semester. They thought it was the coolest thing in the entire world. Oh, I never heard of that before? I'm going to practice it right now. Can I go to the library and record my voice because it's quiet over there? Sure. Can we have one more day in class to work on this? Okay. And they just hit the ground running. I actually was going to do this whole presentation, example, do, and then I got really sick and I could not record my voice. I could barely teach. So um, I used that as a learning moment for me to kind of show them, okay, these are all the in-between steps that, you're, that are going to be part of your final process, um, which got them thinking like, okay, it doesn't go from, from non-existent to perfect. Right? There, there's a process. And then I actually never even had to finish that because they did theirs and they were awesome. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a, that was unanticipated for me, despite Farrah telling me that it was going that they were gonna do really well. So I'm definitely gonna work on incorporating that in other classes in the future. Chris? Um, so uh, difficulties, one thing is as Sabrina's talking, I'm like oh, I need to look and see how she used Google Communities, and then I'm like, oh, remember, you can't. So there's, <laughs> yes. yeah, and Sabrina, in your notes, you were going to say this. So, yeah. so <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> look, um, so the Google Community thing for me was frustrating. So, so two things. Also, John mentioned that students had a hard time moving to the spectacular OneNote, right? Well, I had a hard time moving to, I don't know if it's spectacular or not, Google Communities. So I feel a little better that, you know, I'm old dog not learning new tricks necessarily. Um, but one of the reasons it was difficult was like, Sabrina had this great experience, but you have to be careful how you set it up. Yes, because if you set it up initially, you within the Moravian community, you can't change that. And he is not in the Moravian community. <laughs> so even though I sent him a link, he could not view it. Um, so what was cool was that I could send it then to other people in Moravian who came onto the project and could see what all my students were doing, but as soon as I wanted to send it to Chris. Right, right. And and, and so the other thing is, sure, we could have gotten together, I could have looked on the laptop, everybody thought of that. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we're busy. Well, it's like, it's like 12 miles away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and, and so I think the other challenge in, in any of this is just that, you know, we are busy and it takes time uh, to, to ramp up with this kind of stuff. And so both uh, Gary and I had enough other things going on that we were going to collaborate in this huge way across campuses. We, we, we pared that down, and even that was difficult to, to continue with. Um, so I think also just, just this time that's necessary to spend learning things uh, is, is a challenge. In addition to then, we always have to be careful that technology doesn't kind of step in the way as well. And, and let's be clear that if, well, I don't know. I think, I'm, I, think I understand what I'm about to say, but if Lafayette slash Moravian didn't have their own Google setup, then I don't think we would have run into this problem. Mm -hmm. So there's benefits to having your own thing on campus that's all fancy and schmancy and uses Google, but it got in our way probably. If we had used our own Gmail accounts, I don't think this would have, would have been a problem. <coughs> let, let me just add one more thing onto that uh, that maybe isn't a drawback. Well, it was because understanding how to manage this, when I ask the students, do you like that, that we're going to use your Lafayette email accounts and not your Gmail accounts? Raise your hand. They're all like, yes, because now, you know, they don't have to think about their Gmail stuff being polluted by all this Lafayette. You know, sure, it's about learning, but still. You know, <laughs> um, and yet, it still stood in the way of me really working with them because I, I bet if you've done your thing with your .edu account and your .gmail.com gmail account, you, even if every one of us in this room didn't have a problem, we've all had colleagues who have had a problem that we had to deal with. So I think that that's also a stumbling block that, that is, uh, maybe it's going to diminish over time, but I bet it's not because the students don't necessarily pick it up right away. Sean? Um, yeah, I had, I mean, I have a whole presentation's worth of problems and <laughs> things, <laughs> things I'm going to do differently. But just to highlight a, a few of them, uh, and I think lots of faculty members say this, that you know, when we first envisioned this project, we had all these awesome ideas about everything that we were going to do and bring this all in. But the 
the time it takes to create a good online activity or a lesson for students is was in my experience this year about three to four times the amount of time investment that I would take for a typical face-to-face -face classroom experience. Um, and in fact, I've been teaching for 18 years at Muhlenberg, so I, I can literally look at my notes and take some PowerPoints that I, you know, crafted five years ago and probably go into a classroom with five minutes of preparation to have like a decent to actually really good class. Of course, in an online setting, that would be a disaster if you put that much, <laughs> that amount of time into it. So I think we vastly underestimated the amount of time that it would take to create these online activities. And so as the semester you know, ramped up, we had about four to five weeks worth of really excellent online activities. And then we started playing catch up. And then we got really far behind. Uh, so that was a big um, challenge. But also the challenge that I encountered and, and the members of, of our cohort encountered as well is just a really uh, problem of translation. How to translate something that works well in a face-to-face -face environment into an online uh, task or activity. It, it's one thing to learn how to use the functions of uh, to an online tool, but it's quite another to take those functions and be able to craft an online activity that meets goals in a, in a way that's relevant and, and good. Um, it, it, that process of translation into the online learning uh, was a much bigger learning gap than uh, I would have imagined. Um, I thought that my enthusiasm for technology would be enough, but that's not nearly enough. It's gotta, there's got to be some other different styles of learning on top of that. I also found that, that the students, there was a limit to the number of tools that the students were willing and able to learn within a given semester. So my advice to anyone and everyone is to think uh, very carefully about limiting the number of tools that you ask students to use in a given semester or over a particular period of time. The more tools you can integrate into a single environment, like an LMS environment, or a Google community, let's say, or something like that, I think the better off you are, because then it gives students a one-stop place to access all the things they need to for their course. We also noticed that students who, I think at, at Muhlenberg, students struggle with time management anyway, but if you have students who struggle with time management in any way, they are going to struggle mightily with any form of online education. Uh, whether it's blended or fully online, if you're not able to manage your time effectively, that becomes a serious impediment to students performing well in these courses. So uh, going forward in the fall, when I'll teach the media literacy course again, not team taught, but just at Muhlenberg, um, I will do a lot of scaffolding with the course itself down to having students do an online activity during the class period when I'm there to go to computers and troubleshoot with them and then slowly move to having them do those activities on their own and then report back. Uh, we just assumed that students would do the activities and then report back, but when students encountered a kind of error or a problem or a hiccup in the service that we wanted them to use, they just threw up their hands and said, well, I can't use this. and then told us in class the next week by that time it would be way too late. So we just need to work with that. The other thing that I that we did notice, and this is the last thing I'll say, is that uh, we, between one semester and the next, we tried two different models of classroom flipping. In the fall semester with our introductory students, because they were introductory students, we had the first face-to-face -face classroom environment that dealt, that explored the topics that were in the chapter, and then the online component was exploring those topics further, right? So we introduced the topics in a face-to-face -face environment, made sure the students understood the concepts, and then they work, worked with them in extending those concepts online. During the spring semester, we tried the opposite. We had their first exposure to the concepts online, and then we brought them into the classroom to do to work with those concepts in a face-to-face -face environment. The second was a disaster. <laughs> that was a total disaster. So, and it goes, I think goes back to students being challenged with understanding concepts, uh, reading effectively, being able to identify key concepts in their reading. Um, so I like the idea of having students actually do this kind of group highlighting tool or something, something like that to be able to assess how and how effectively they're doing 
reading to understand those concepts. Because then we end up playing catch up during the sessions that were meant to be devoted to exploring and further furthering their knowledge about the core concepts. We had to spend at least half of that face-to-face -face class just reviewing the core concepts. So we lost time over that. So that second method of flipping, at least in uh, the spring semester, was kind of a disaster. During the fall, that actually worked quite well. Thank you. All right, so we'll spend the next 15 minutes talking about suggestions and recommendations you have for the audience, because I know, speaking with all of you, you have a lot of them. And then we'll leave the final 15 minutes for questions and answers from everyone else. So we'll start with Sabrina. What suggestions do you have for others looking to create learning materials across institutions or campuses? So I think a lot of uh, the suggestions have been throughout our comments thus far. Uh, the ones that I would like to highlight um, are to be flexible and to be willing to fail. Um, there's a lot of trial and error. Right? And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are not, that are outside of our control, right? Like uh, if you're doing intercampus collaboration, the schedule, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, in, uh, we, um, sorry, Lafayette and Moravian have different, yeah, Lafayette and Moravian have different, of course, um, academic calendars. Um, we have different learning management systems. We have different time periods during the day in which we teach, right? And I think that Chris and Gary taught Tuesday, Thursday. I taught Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So when did we talk to each other? <laughs> yeah. um, so anything that you can do before the semester begins is incredibly helpful. And to be really clear in your goals, um, your ongoing communication, and your preparation, you cannot be too prepared. But then on the same note with being flexible, you can't be tied to exactly what you were going to do because you don't know the students who are going to be in your classroom. You don't know what their needs are going to be. And you know what worked last semester might not work this semester. We all know that. Um, so really just be flexible and give yourself a lot of extra time. So I said um, with Farah there, I think I planned maybe three class periods to work on screencasting and it ended up being five, right? Um, and once early in the semester, Farah came in and just gave the, here's what screencasting is, right? Here are some examples. And that was before the students even had the project. So just to start getting them thinking about what they're going to be doing. And then we had a full week workshop and then we had a practice presentation session where the students presented to me and Farah uh, and that was really helpful, I think, for, for them gaining their confidence and for them to see what their classmates were doing, for them to share ideas. Um, so I think the, the communication with your partner, um, the flexibility, and the willingness to fail, regroup, and try again are uh, my top three tips. Um, I would agree that we've, we've said a lot of this, I think, as we've gone on. Um, you know. Kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we all we all know what it means. We all know that we should pay attention to it, and so often we don't, right? And I think I think we we've, we've heard that a, a couple times. Um, I think also that uh, one way to say something that we've been saying as we've gone on is that you can't do this in one semester. You can't just if, if it's going to take you three or four times. It's it's partly also that it's going to three or four times the amount of time in the first semester you do it, it's going to take less time, right? We all, John and I can remember somewhere around 15 years ago how much time we did spend creating a class, you know, so it was. Um, so on that note, uh, we, as I think we've already said, you know, you have to be ready to fail. I think Sabrina just said this, right? But let's just think, first of all, you know, if you're pre-tenure, where you go? <laughs> if you're pre-tenure, if you don't have a supportive uh, environment in which, you know, you're encouraged let's put it clearly, to fail, you're encouraged to experiment, then this is going to be a very difficult thing to do. And, and I think that in, in most, if not all, academic environments, we have to think about who is doing this work and who we can support doing this work. Uh, I think that's a, a, that could be a whole topic uh, in mm -hmm. itself. So I think that all of us have to recognize that, that it's going to take some, some practice, some learning, Keep it simple, um, uh, because you, you'll never keep it simple enough. But also, we need to think about the structures that we have to, to support within a department, uh, as well as uh, across the college. John? Um, I would agree with everything that's been uh, said. Uh, 
one of the things that I and one of the things that I didn't mention because it's very specific to my discipline, and that's that in terms of uh, creating lecture materials or any kind of supplementary materials, we could not use YouTube at all because many of the examples that we use are culled from the mainstream media, and if we place them on YouTube, they immediately get taken down for copyright violations. So YouTube, Vimeo, a lot of these services were off limits to us as uh, services that could actually hold a lot of our video. That was one interesting thing that we learned. But again, that's very particular to um, media and communication. But one of the things that um, I think was talked about this morning um, was that uh, students need some basic information and technology literacy. That many, so many students come to this with so many different competency mm -hmm. levels that it would be helpful, I think, for professors to have a set uh, amount, a ground floor of what students were familiar with and could be capable of understanding. And whether that gets built into the beginning of a <coughs> blended course, or whether it's something that's at the beginning of a student's, um, a student's college or university career, but that then they carry through to all their courses. Those kinds of things can be helpful uh, for, for us. Um, I would agree that, you know, spend, block out much more time than you think you were going to need for um, changing one of your courses over, and change them over piecemeal. So don't do what I did, which is to, and what we did, which is to take a whole course and imagine that in a single semester you're going to turn a switch, it's going to go from face to face to blended. Uh, don't do that. Go very slowly, <laughs> and maybe over time you get a larger percentage of your course that becomes blended <coughs> until you reach a certain threshold, right? So when you're teaching online education during the summer or even during the regular semester, oftentimes you don't have that luxury. But at the liberal arts college setting, if you do have that luxury, begin to introduce blended elements in your course very slowly and piecemeal with lots of scaffolding because liberal arts college students come with a set of expectations about what their learning is going to be. And if those expectations are not met, there is uh, active resistance um, to that. And that active resistance, even if it's not uh, visible to you in the classroom, it can show up in slightly nasty ways in um, course evaluations and so on. So um, just understand where, where students are at. We experienced that students, in order to keep in touch with students, that email is increasingly becoming a very um, unhelpful tool um, in which to contact our students. Um, they'd be much more likely to, let's say, um, get something popping up on their Twitter feed than to actually look at an email. Uh, unless the email said that it was snowing and we were canceling class. <laughs> so no, those, those emails all find their home. Uh, but emails of regular updates about course, about the course and changes to the course, that was often uh, very difficult and uh, anxiety producing for students because they just didn't, you know, check their email or weren't able to process their email and maybe they get too many emails and can't process them at all. Uh, and some professors say, well, too bad, they need to check their email. That's part of like what being a college student is these days. Uh, on the other hand, if you're teaching a, a blended course and you rely on having that online interaction with students, we need to find better ways for regularly communicating with students in ways that, that meet them where they are. So uh, one of the things we didn't implement in this class is any kind of social media outreach to our students. Um, but I'm coming around to the notion that that may be important going forward. All right, so should we open this up to questions? Yeah, um, I was interested, I mean, one of the themes, I'm very new to this, but one of the themes I'm hearing about is keep it simple, baby steps, go slow, piecemeal. If a campus had um, a way to incentivize people to move into this, do you think it would be a good idea to structure those incentives by saying, no, this isn't for changing a class, it's for changing an assignment, or at most a unit. And it has to have a reflective component at the end where you talk about what worked and what didn't, and it's only going to have at most one or two. And you set all those things you warned us about into the incentive, and people say, well, that looks doable. 
you know, or is it better to say, no, no, let the greyhounds from the slips and, you know, and discover them on their own, because now you're infringing on faculty freedom. Right. Which, which is the better way to go? I, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I guess based on what we say, uh, the better in some sense um, you may have more success is, is what you're talking about. And um, I'm nodding because we have a, a current initiative on campus that is exactly that. Um, now, what we did for the Teagles grant was a course development and changes and big changes. Um, but we have a Mellon grant initiative on campus, and, and I'm going to be part of that for the fall, which is redo one assignment in this first year seminar writing course. And that's how they're pitching it, exactly like you said. Um, but to be honest, there's still hesitancy. Right? We just got an email that the deadline for applying has been extended because they still have money left over. Right, and enough people haven't haven't applied. Um, but that is one assignment for one course, so it's very very small. Yeah. I was wondering if you could. I, I, I'm new to your the the overall intent of what the Teagle Grant did for you all. What got you motivated to? What was the point of the the cross uh, institutional collaboration? So I, that's a separate question for the two of us and for John, right? And then there's yeah. there could be two other groups. Uh, and I think they're, they're, uh, Elbeck didn't say yes to everybody, right? I think there were, there were some applications that didn't make it through. But mostly, Sabrina and I wanted to work together. Mm -hmm. I think that's 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 the thing. And we figured out that uh, you know Gary was teaching this marketing research class in the spring. It coalesced with some goals that uh, the department had for Sabrina's class. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and and Chris and I have worked collaboratively on projects in the past, um, so we already had that foundation mm -hmm. of a partnership. Yeah, and uh, again, it was tough to to realize this cross institutional community based learning and research. But Gary and I both were very excited about it. <laughs> Maybe we'll try again. Uh, but that was also the fact that we could do this community-based learning research. He and I learned from each other. Our students learned from each other. Um, we're, we really should try again. But uh, but that that was a big part of our excitement for the project too. We can tell you a little bit about the Teagle Grant yeah. itself. Um, so the Teagle Foundation is funding. Uh, projects that are looking at traditional um, private colleges and looking to get students who are traditional students engaged in blended learning, engaged in flipped classrooms, and doing a lot more things online and interacting to become more digitally literate. Uh, so those are some of their goals. So when the initial call for proposals went out, uh, we were looking for individuals who are innovative and creative and looking to try some new cool things with their students that are used to the face-to-face -face interaction of traditional classrooms. Mm -hmm. So the projects that got funded, like Chris, Sabrina, and Gary, and John, Liz, and Jim, projects like these were trying to really just engage students in very different ways of learning than they're, they're used to on, on traditional campuses. So those are the types of projects that we were looking for. We also have two other projects that ran this past year where they created um, modules and pieces, not entire courses. Mm -hmm. So um, we have four new projects coming up this academic year, which are doing kind of a little bit of both. So we have some, some projects that are creating actual courses and some that are creating modules. But they're all cross-institutional because we are looking to develop faculty collaboration. We're looking to develop faculty digital literacy as well as student engagement. I just was curious about your comment, John, although perhaps all of you could reflect on this, about it takes three to four times as much time to get prepped for this. But you could have dusted off your previous notes and gone in and winged it, and it really would go pretty well. Um, so that begs the question of how much carryover do you think there is from the materials you currently have now that have this digital, collaborative, interinstitutional nature that you'd be able to dust off next year and be able to say, oh, well, really, this is not uh, not so bad. And, and the, the background of this question is sustainability. Mm -hmm. If we're moving to this sort of a mode of delivery overall, is it going to be more time intensive, less time intensive, or about the same as where we are with face-to-face -face now. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I would say the upfront time costs are much more intensive than what we have right now. And since I haven't gone, I, this is the first time I've done this. So, I mean, it seems like a cop out to say ask me in five years mm -hmm. if I've ha achieved some kind of time savings. But, uh, you know, we're always adding new things, adding new kinds of uh, materials to our coursework. But um, my, the traditional mode, what happened was, let me back up a second, what happened was when I approached um, doing the digital or online materials, I took the same mode of, uh, of teaching and learning and, and instructional design as I do for a face-to-face -face class. So it's, okay, I typically do a 25-minute lecture and then we do an activity. So let me just transfer that to online. Let me make a 25-minute lecture video and then have them do an activity. Well, the students got through five minutes of the online lecture and then no one watched the rest of it, right? So mm -hmm. I can't, it was like, I can't translate in that one-to-one -one just to a digital online environment. So in part, the answer to your question is, I think you do much better if you radically compartmentalize learning into much smaller modules and chunks. That is two benefits. Well, three benefits. One, students will actually engage with that. That's the biggest benefit. But number two, it allows you to be creative in how you structure and move around those modules from one learning unit to the next. And three, if you find that one of those modules is unsuccessful or it doesn't really work that well, or it's really outdated and doesn't work, you're not uh, catapulting or dumping a huge amount of material that would require you to rework all that from one semester to the next. It's just one small portion that you maybe need to redo with updated data or new research or new information. And then suddenly it becomes less about, I have to redesign this whole day uh, worth of coursework, or and I just have to redesign this five minute uh, piece that I want students to interact with. So, you know, everyone says you should work with small modular pieces, but I can see the real benefit of ramping those down into those much smaller chunks. Any guess on the sustainability question? <clears throat> Are you going to, would people say, oh yeah, well we're going to move this way and we're currently a 3-3 load and sorry, we're going to have to go to a 2-2 load because otherwise we just can't do it. Oh, do you mean sustainability from what faculty time? Did yeah. Faculty time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's it's it's a it's a huge huge <coughs> question, right? Um, about whether or not faculty, and this is why faculty stay away from these kinds of things because they do a very uh, shrewd cost benefit analysis, and they find that you know they've been doing it the same way for 25 years. They've been doing very well, thank you very much. Their students have been learning. What's the possible benefit of doing it this way? And I think students make the same cost benefit analysis, I should say, because oh, yeah. students look at this and they say, why should I be doing these online activities when this doesn't match my expectation for what I'm supposed to be getting from a liberal arts environment? So I actually got some feedback, I did some analytics, got some feedback um, at the end of, we did a survey that we uh, designed at the end of each of these courses and we got what seemed to be very conflicting uh, qualitative uh, responses. So on the one hand, the students said, I love the fact that uh, I only had class once a week and I could do the other activities on my <laughs> own time. And by the same token, there was uh, responses that said, I felt like the professor really wasn't doing their job. They really weren't presenting the information to me. This was a cop out. Uh, why, you know, so in other words, I was working four times as hard <laughs> and I was being castigated for doing that by my students. So with experiences like that, it's it's a, no wonder that faculty are reticent to take this on because the the benefits are, at least in the near term, are few. But the real question is, are there, are there more benefits in the longer term? And that I think is an open question. And I like this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I like doing this, and that's, that's how I respond to that. Gentlemen in the back. I'm so glad you said what you just did, because I, I was going to pose the heretical question, is this worth it? Yeah. Um, I mean, you were very comprehensive and self-reflective, and you also introduced things we've been hearing throughout the past couple of days, and uh, it's also clear that blended learning is a really big tent. There are many moving parts, and some of them, well, where the boundaries are is that's no longer clear. But what you've just said is extremely important, I think. Even allowing for the fact that we're in some kind of transitional moment, 
Um, many of us weren't trained, we have to be retrained. Students have different expectations. The technologies are shifting. Uh, liberal arts is sinking in a larger culture. Colleges are having financial crises. You know, a, a whole variety of environmental factors bearing on this experiment. Um, and I'm feeling both more informed and less optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> well, the track record is not good, right? So whenever you see throughout the history of the 20th century, new communication and uh, technologies emerge that are uh, reputed to revolutionize the uh, provision of higher education or education in general. Or life. Uh, right, <laughs> then you know, in the 1920s it was radio that was yes. going to uh, revolutionize uh, the way in which we educated. In the 1940s and 50s it was television that was going to revolutionize the way that we uh, provide teaching. And you know, we're still having classrooms, we're still having lectures, and you know we're you know over 100 years uh, outside of these the introduction of these new technologies. So I, I, I believe that there will be some kind of hybridization of education. Um, I don't know what the, what the whether or not we're going whole hog into this, uh, but there certainly is a lot of money out there to support <laughs> these initiatives, and that can go a long way in pushing these forward. But um, you know it's going to be up to individual faculty members who are using these to determine whether or not this is going to be a long-standing trend or whether this is a relatively short-lived flash in the pan. So um, I would think one of the things that seems to be difficult to answer, especially in the liberal arts, is are they learning more this way, right? Because there seems to be kind of a resistance to any kind of standardized outcomes measures. But if you don't have that, aren't you just left with the sort of popularity contest of the student evaluations and things like that? Is this, you know, do we need something like a more you know, either on a professor specific level, like I'm teaching this class online, I'm teaching in class, you know, it's, maybe we don't care if they hate it, if they learn more. Um, you know, we'll, I guess just comment on that aspect, anybody. You know, how do we know whether they're learning more? I think we have to do a better job with assessment, and, and probably in more ways than just this. Um, but for right now, we've done some surveys Right, and we have some data on that. I mean, for me, I'm in a situation where this was a brand new course, so I don't even have another course to compare to another semester. Um, I have general feedback from students that um, engagement was up, right, and that they found connections between this material and other material outside my classroom. I don't know if that would have happened with other activities because I had never taught the course before. Yeah, but it's, a, it's an excellent question. <coughs> um, it's, a, it's the right question. I'm not going to give the right answer to it because yeah. the real answer is about data, yeah. right? Uh, but one thing about cross-campus collaboration is that it's, I'm not going to say this in a judgmental way, it's difficult for students to leave their campus mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons that, that make sense and some we can scoff at. Um, but uh, if they can collaborate in a way across campuses, uh, that do, that still fits within the way that a campus works, then then maybe that's something new. Now I didn't. Uh, the right answer is how do we assess this? Yeah. But still, I'm just kind of offering this, this other this other way to learn in this other way. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to where was there a gain from the students being able to collaborate across campus? I I can imagine it if we have a small numbers problem, but yeah. right. I'm so presuming numbers, that you had enough students on both campuses to make I think to small, work. small numbers matters, uh, uh, you know, seeing two different projects. Mm -hmm. Seeing one project that's with the theater department, seeing another project with, with, that's with an LGBTQ uh, okay. community group. Now, I see some of uh, what we call also soft skill development in the cross campus. I'm sorry, soft skill development uh -huh. in the cross campus collaboration, where students have to learn how to communicate with people who are in different culture right, than they are, and then that sort of gives them more preparation for leaving the community eventually. Mm -hmm. question right? Yeah, this, uh, that was actually my question. Um, but a follow-up question is, did you and how do you talk to students about the cultural differences across campus? I'm really interested. I see clearly how the faculty collaboration across institutions and campuses is faculty development. It's great. It's exciting. It's what makes me want to teach when I do these kinds of projects. But for students, I had that question. You started to answer it. But more specifically, maybe, 
or, or I wonder if there's anything more you can say about what you hope in the future or what you did hope, maybe it didn't work out for this first iteration, students were going to learn by being in courses with peers from other campuses, but also how you talk to them or how you might next time think about talking to them of the value of collaborating with peers across campuses at presumably at, a, at different kinds of institutions, although they're all small of arts colleges. Um, I think the further question is why small of arts colleges for these kinds of collaborations? I think we see some of the funders moving away from these models, right, to try to cross different kinds of institutions, but sorry, that was more than I one think, question. I think Chris and John can best answer that question. My students didn't collaborate across Canada. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, thank you for setting up as what would I imagine because that's that's really kind of where I am on this. Uh, but I'll just repeat: in a community-based learning exercise, it means that they can get exposure to two different projects. Mm -hmm. uh, the culture question, um, I don't think I know enough about. Um, the challenge that we uh, we're facing also was the level of uh, mathematical statistical preparation between the two mm -hmm. uh, departments in terms of what we require of them. Um, but I don't think that's terrible because you know um, comment, commenting on each other's approaches can still occur even without a huge degree of sophistication level. Yeah, I mean I think the student cross campus collaboration was the most difficult and challenging part of our collaboration, uh, getting students to interact with one another. Not because they didn't like the students on the other campus, but that they we ran headlong into student expectations about how communication flows happen within the course. So the communication flows happen from student to professor. Mm -hmm. And so we were always at the apex of this triangle, and we have students on either campus both of whom I had great interactions with the students from Cedarcrest, mm -hmm. and they saw me as a co-professor of their course, and I really enjoyed that. And you know, we commented on each other's students in the online space, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But for the students to contact one another mm -hmm. to finish the bottom of that triangle was that you know you could put a dotted line down there in the bottom because that was incredibly difficult. And we tried all kinds of ways of fostering that and providing incentives for them to not just, you know, put on in a discussion forum, but then to respond to the posts by other students. And in some cases that worked nicely. In other cases, it was incomplete. Um, that kind of, but mostly because they were looking up here to the apex of the triangle. So we were the go-betweens between the students. Whereas we wanted to remove ourselves from the equation, that became very, very difficult. So oh, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm excited to learn more, you know, some strategies to encourage that uh, among the students. I mean, we do that all the time in face-to-face -face classes by facilitating discussion during groups, things like that. But in an online space, that becomes a little more challenging. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll add two things, sorry. Thank you. Um, Can I do uh, one real quick? It might, it might yeah. help, John, if you could just quickly describe the, the student populations at Muhlenberg versus Cedar Right, Crest. so Cedar Crest is an all-women's college. And Muhlenberg is co-ed, uh, but there are other kinds of cultural differences between Cedarcrest students and Muhlenberg students. There are differences in socioeconomic status between right. the two campuses, yeah. and in part, part of this collaboration was to, I mean, I had in my mind was to have my students interact with other students. Um, Cedarcrest College is also a little more diverse than Muhlenberg mm -hmm. College, or it's as diverse or a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I wanted those mm -hmm. kind of perspectives to come together in the course in interesting ways as well. Mm -hmm. um, that happened to some of the students really took it on, mm -hmm. and really um, they, they worked on project groups together, they presented their projects together, and they were fully integrated group projects between the two campuses. Others fell apart halfway through the semester, and those groups had to do single campus mm -hmm group presentations because their groups just didn't cohere mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, we so, so that was part of the that was part of the you know trying to bring students from different backgrounds together mm -hmm. to <coughs> work on these soft skills but also you know on these collaborative skills. Right and so I guess what I'm interested in is how you talk to the students about that project. Um, or if you, it sounds like you didn't and I have never done this before either but I'm very interested in how talking about 
cultural, socioeconomic differences and the higher ed infrastructures mm -hmm. that those tend to go with in student bodies across campuses yeah. in this kind of, I think it can be a wonderful opportunity for higher education <laughs> right now, but it's such a challenge. So yes, and I, and I think know. being up, up front with students about that, that's another, you know, um, communication and transparency with students is another big element that I think was missing from the ways in which I presented the material to the students and presented the goal. So I think part of students want to know the reason why they're doing the things that they're asked to do. Um, everything, not just at the beginning of the semester in the syllabus. So my response is often, well, it's in the syllabus, that, you know, that's not good enough, right? It has to be part of an ongoing dialogue with the students about why they're being asked to do what they're being asked to do and what are the benefits to them, um, not just for their learning, but other types of benefits they might experience. So I, I think um, getting pointers on how to articulate that to students, uh, would it, I'm always open for that. But I, th I feel like that, that greater transparency, students are wanting that, which is completely reasonable. And one thing that I'm pretty sure I heard John say uh, back when we were all sitting with Farron and, and, and talking about this stuff was, I don't think you said this today, who's determining my grade? <laughs> and in, in a way that may provide, that, that question may even in itself provide some way to think about these things that we're talking about. That's so trivial compared to the different socioeconomic uh, groups across the campuses. Um, but it, in a way, students have that in common across all campuses too. <laughs> um, but also, I think it, it also gives us a way to, and, and as, as much as we don't want students to just think about the grade, it still gives us a way to think about how are the students viewing this relationship and that apex of the triangle. You know, I think it's that too. And, and I'll say too that very quickly, Gary and I realized that we could not make groups. Okay, so John, you did that. Maybe we should just think about it more. But we did not want to make groups that crossed campuses. We decided that we would only have a group working with the Easton project and a group working with the Bethlehem uh -huh. project, and that they would each critique each other. But we, but the, even just the scheduling ideas, mm -hmm. you know, we have 410. We're a Division One campus. We have 410 reserved for uh, athletics. Maybe that's a great time for for Moravian students to get together and talk, you know. And other times are no good. I, there, there's a ton of things going on this. And we did that the second semester because it kind of fell apart in the fall semester. <coughs> this cross, this group collaborative groups. So we did have separate groups, but each of them presented to one another in the spring semester, yeah. and they critiqued one another, and they offered um, comments about each other's projects online. So whereas the groups were separate, we kind of did what you did based on our learning experiences and some of the failures we had during the fall semester. Yeah.